This is the show where our team at CNBC TV 18 gets you the top stories of the day. I am Nitya Balakrishnan and you are watching Reporter's Diary. First up, let's get all the action from the Lal Street where the bulls ended the trading week on a high. The Nifty closed half a percent higher and managed to stay above that 10,600 mark. The Sensex also saw gains of over half a percent with the broader markets underperforming the benchmark indices today as the mid caps saw cuts of over a quarter of a percent. The banks, however, continued their upward trajectory and ended the day a quarter of a percent higher. Let's bring in Surbhi Upadhyay who's here with all the action from today's trading day. Surbhi, what were the ups and downs? Well, a good close to a good week, but there are some buts. Perhaps that's how you can sum up Friday's action. So the good news first, the market uh, managed to see a buy on dips today. And in fact, we've ended very close to the highs of the day with the Nifty once again approaching the 10,700 level. But that is the problem because that is where it runs into key resistances around the 200 DMA. Uh, the other interesting facet of trade today has been that the buying was largely restricted to the bigger stocks, to the large caps, to the reliances and the HDFC twins of the world. Uh, the mid-cap arena was a little sluggish and the mid-cap index was underperforming through Throughout. The market breadth was negative throughout the session as well. Let's talk about the gainers. And we have an unlikely winner today in the form of Bharti Airtel. A 10% move on that stock put it in pole position. It was followed up by consistent buying in Aisha Motors after their Tamil Nadu plant has reopened after the strike. Uh, and Reliance Industries, as I mentioned, was uh, quite strong throughout with almost a 3% gain for the day. Financials were again batting for the bulls, both on the NBFC side and the banking side. So today's key winners included names like uh, Bajaj Finserv, Bajaj Finance, the HDFC twins, as I mentioned, and even a State Bank of India. What didn't work today? Yes, Bank, for sure. It's one issue after the next. And now this was Mr. Opie Bhatt's resignation, which led to another 8% drawdown on the stock today. Uh, and JSW Steel and Tata Steel from the fairer side of uh, the market were also under pressure. Housing finance companies have been under strain as well. That was a key facet of the Friday action. So whether it's India Bulls Housing, DHFL, Canfin Homes, all of these stocks were down and out. Speaking of losers, let's get to some more names on the mid-cap side. PFC and REC on news that the government is going to persist uh, telling REC to buy its stake in PFC. That news did not go down well with both of those stocks. And NMDC under strain again because of regulatory issues around a very important mine for them in Karnataka. Finally, if I talk about some of the winners on the mid-cap side of the market, then Jet Airways, hope afloat. 6% uh, up move on the stock once again, hoping that we'll get some news from the Tata Sons board meet by the time we come back to trade on Monday. Vodafone Idea and even a Venkis. Shifting gears to a crucial corporate development then, the all-important meeting of the Tata Sons board ends and Tata Sons in a statement indicates that over the last few year, days there has been growing speculation in the print and electronic media about Tata Group's interest in Jet Airways. They however said that such discussions are preliminary and have been preliminary and no proposal as such has been made just yet. But there are more key developments. Sources tell your channel that in the interest of the deal, Tata Sons and Naresh Goyal are working towards a middle ground on the contentious issue of Goyal continuing to hold a minority stake in the merged entity post the deal. Let's bring in Nisha Podar, who's joining us with the latest details of those talks from our newsroom in Mumbai. Nisha, thanks for joining in. And what really are your sources indicating? So over the last couple of days, I've spoken to several sources who are directly involved in this transaction between Tata Sons as well as Jet Airways. Sources with direct knowledge share with me that at this point, what could be a potential deal breaker is Naresh Goel's stand to have a minority stake in the merged entity between Vistara and Jet Airways and also retain a board seat on the combined entity. Now remember, in the interest of this transaction going through and to really get across and cross the hurdle of this deal breaker, both the parties have now entered into a negotiation to settle this particular issue so that they can go ahead with the transaction. Sources suggest that while they are on the negotiation table, both the sides would be taking a step back on their earlier stand on this contentious issue. What I do gather is that to reach a middle ground, both of them are softening their position. The proposal that is being talked about right now 
now as sources with direct knowledge share with me is that Tata Sons is looking at probably considering a minority stake to Naresh Goyal's family, maybe in lieu of that also give a bought seat to either Naresh Goyal or his son, but all that is going to be a limited period of time. There will be several crosses and parts of the proposal and agreement that will restrict Naresh Goyal from selling the stake at any given time without the approval of Tata Group. Tata Group is not only going to have an ROFR if this deal really goes through on this particular stake, but maybe may also retain the sole right of buyback after a certain period of time. So controlling the way Naresh Goel may navigate in terms of selling that share going forward and even the holding capacity for a period of time is something that Ara Sans probably is working on. And on the other hand, Naresh Goel has been pitching in for staying in and also continuing on the board of uh, Jet Airways plus Vistara post the transaction for at least a certain number of years. So those transaction details are going on, those negotiations are going on, there are many moving parts, all the parts of Tata Group, Tata Sun's board as well as Naresh Koel on the same, will have to be on the same page for this particular contentious issue to be resolved between the two parties which are deliberating on a possible transaction. All right, Nisha, very crucial details there emerging. But at the moment, Tata Sons having indicated that any such discussions are preliminary and no proposal has been made on this deal just yet. Well, from one big board meeting right on to another then, this is the meet that markets and economists have been anxiously tracking. And this is the RBI board meet that's scheduled on the 19th of November, the coming Monday. Now, the government through its board members is expected to raise crucial issues regarding capital, liquid as well as PCA norms. The meeting holds significance as it comes, remember, amidst the ongoing rift between the government and the RBI over a host of issues, really. Let's bring in Lata Venkatesh, who's joining us more with details of this meeting. Lata, what exactly are the key expectations come Monday? Well, from the various public statements, it appears that at least five contentious issues uh, will be raised at the board meeting. The first of them is the minimum capital that banks are required to keep. Uh, the Reserve Bank's rule for the last 20 years has been that 9% should be the minimum capital, but Basel rules, uh, which is the internationally followed norm, uh, require 8% capital, and uh, that's what uh, the government uh, uh, has been uh, insisting on. It's expected that the board will also uh, insist that RBI bring down the capital uh, requirements so that uh, banks can lend more. Uh, the RBI stands so far, and uh, uh, it so far for the past 20 years has has been that in India more capital is needed because uh, it is very difficult to retrieve uh, defaulting assets. Uh, the legal process is extremely long and cumbersome. The opportunity cost of money is uh, high as well. Uh, the uh, transaction costs like stamp duty, etc. are very high. So you can't really retrieve as much assets as you can. Laws given default is very high. They also point out that many Asian and emerging market countries have between 9 and 11 percent minimum capital requirement. The next contentious issue will be uh, the uh, prompt and corrective action uh, filters. Uh, a bank is put into prompt and corrective action regimen or straight jacket if uh, its uh, capital falls below a certain level, if its net NPAs are higher than 6% and if it's uh, making losses for two years in a row. The uh, government has been insisting that in all over the world it's only the capital filter that's applied and therefore RBI too should remove the other two filters. Uh, RBI is insisting that uh, provisioning in India is very, very little compared to global standards uh, globally in many dispensations, many jurisdictions. Uh, as soon as a loan goes bad, it's provided for 100%. Uh, in India, you provide 15% in the first year and therefore, on an average, it's only about 50% that's provided for. Uh, a third contentious issue would be liquidity. Now, the battle began with uh, arranging more liquidity for NBFCs. Chances are that may not be insisted upon because even uh, lately, most bond market guys, including uh, the much respected KK Mystery, have pointed out that uh, the NBFCs have found most of their uh, commercial paper getting rolled over. So liquidity is not the problem it was a couple of months back. 
therefore the uh, uh, stress may be on generally providing more liquidity the rbi has done open market purchase of bonds but the government and its nominees and the board could insist for more they could even insist on a crr cut a fifth and very important point of discussion would be a package for msmes and smes uh, uh, the uh, package could be uh, in the form of a demand that the capital that must be set aside for a sme loan may be brought down uh, you know at the moment it's 100% which means you have to provide 9 rupees for a 100 rupee loan uh, in by way of capital that the demand could be that you bring it down so that banks give more loans to smes it could also be that classification of a, a loan as an npa be extended to non payment of interest for 180 days instead of the current 90 days because smes uh, by their nature are in a difficult terrain it could also be a one time restructuring uh, the uh, last point which was supposedly very contentious but may take a back seat is the capital that the reserve bank has and which the government thinks uh, is extra reserve bank is seen as an overcapitalized central bank uh, that may have gotten toned down in recent uh, days we have heard the government saying that they don't want the rbi's capital but they want a framework to analyze how much capital the rbi should keep so some discussion on that is likely uh, be that as it may there are uh, divergent and uh, fiercely divergent views and hence it could be a contentious board meeting Thanks for highlighting the key takeaways and expectations really from that crucial board meeting and undoubtedly all eyes will be on that meeting but ahead of that Lata caught up with C Rangarajan a former RBI governor and he is of the opinion that the RBI board should not direct the governor but should rather offer advice and that's not all Rangarajan also feels that the government would be sending the wrong signals out if it uses section 7 of the RBI act to get its way in a sense the way it has evolved is that the reserve bank board has been more advisory in character rather than deciding on specific issues uh, therefore that that is the nature of the board and that is the nature of the way in which decisions have so far been taken i would think that that evolution is a good evolution and that is a way in which the relationship between the uh, the reserve bank um, headed by the governor and the board uh, uh, should be important change that has happened which has given autonomy to the reserve bank of india in terms of monetary policy the finance minister gets to know what the change in uh, the policy rate is along with you and me and therefore that is an important change that has uh, Uh, that has uh, happened uh, therefore uh, i would say in the present situation section 7 should not be used because it will give wrong signals it is time for the government and the rbi to sit together in a spirit of accommodation and find answers to the problem section 7 uh, should not be used now And the yes back stock tanked over 7% in trade today and was the top nifty loser this of course on the bank of news that former SBI chairman OP Butt who was an external expert on the bank's search and selection committee had resigned the offered reason for his resignation was conflict of interest let's bring in Ritu Singh who's now joining us for more details Ritu what exactly are we going to understand from this move really of OP Butt resigning indicating conflict of interest That's right we understand that OP Bhatt who was part of the search and selection committee to find a successor for Rana Kapoor once he leaves the bank at the end of January next year has resigned from that committee citing reasons relating to potential conflict of interest now we understand that among the 10 uh, people that have been shortlisted for the CEO position so far is one a senior executive from Standard Chartered Bank and given that Mr OP Bhatt also serves as an independent director on the board of Standard Chartered there was a clear case of conflict of interest because of which we understand from sources mr op bhat chose to resign uh, but that aside uh, the process of selection will continue and we understand that uh, yes bank aims to shortlist enough candidates and send at least three names to the reserve bank of india for their consideration by mid december now on a separate note we also understand and this is information uh, that my colleague sonal sachdev has also picked up uh, is that uh, you know standard chartered is upset that it was not made aware of the fact that mr op bhat would be joining the search and selection 
Judicial Committee. And therefore, there were some uh, tensions relating to that as well, uh, which could have also, uh, you know, led to Mr. O.P. but finally resigning from this committee. We reached out to Yes Bank and Standard Chartered Bank. Both of them declined to comment. And Mr. O.P. Bhatt was not reachable for any comments on the story. Thanks, Ritu, for that. And let's keep it with this story. Yes Bank is, however, projecting a strong front as of now. And people in the know tell CNBC TV18 that the selection process for identifying the bank's new MD and CEO is pretty much on schedule. The selection committee met on November 2nd and shortlisted uh, 10 candidates according to sources. Let's cut across to Abhishek Khutari for more details about this development. Abhishek, what exactly are you picking up from your sources? The selection process is on schedule, as you mentioned, to identify the new MD and CEO for the bank. Now, they had a search and selection committee which met on uh, 2nd of November. The search and selection committee have shortlisted about 10 candidates. So, the interview process for those 10 candidates have already begun and uh, they will be conducting interviews from now till about November end or December first week. The interviews of shortlisted uh, candidates by committee will uh, begin. So, bank plans to send about final list of four to five names to RBI by uh, third week of December. They are intending to uh, send more names so that there is uh, no issues with RBI. They don't want any further issues with RBI and RBI should not be unhappy. Coming on to the Kapoor versus Kapoor uh, reconciliation that is happening, over their families of both Rana Kapoor and Madhu Kapoor met uh, first time uh, in last 10 years on Diwali. So peace over there has also begun and the families uh, both have withdrawn their unreasonable demands that they were demanding with each other and families may get uh, to full uh, conciliation by the end of this month or by November. So the likelihood of, you know, MD process not getting impacted by Madhu Kapoor is uh, the likely news that we are picking from our source. Back to you. Straight then to the big development from the court corner. The Apex Court today asked exiled CBI chief Alok Verma to respond to charges leveled against him by the Central Vigilance Commission, terming the 50-page report as a mixed bag and exhaustive one. The Chief Justice of India, Ranjan Gogoi, told Verma's lawyer that further inquiry was inquired into some of these charges. Let's bring in Ashmit Kumar, who was at that courtroom earlier today and is joining us with the details. Ashmit, what exactly were the other key takeaways from today's hearing, really? Right, for just uh, the benefit of our viewers, the report that is being spoken of is the CBC's investigation report into the allegations against Alok Verma. Keep in mind that the Apex Court was the one uh, that had directed the CBC to go ahead with this probe, the caveat being it would be headed by a retired Judge Justice A.K. Patnaik. Now, that very report was submitted on Monday earlier this week before the Apex Court, and today was, of course, uh, the hearing. There was a great deal of expectations in terms of uh, clarity that was expected from the Apex Court on the way forward. Uh, what we have instead uh, uh, were observations falling from uh, the, the bench headed by the Chief Justice. Uh, Justice Gogoi observed uh, that there appear to be some findings within the CVC report. He's gone through the report. There appear to be some findings uh, which are favorable, which are complementary uh, to Alok Burma. There are other findings on some charges uh, which are not so favorable, or which are uncomplimentary. That's the word uh, that had been used by Justice Gogoi. Essentially, uh, the prayer that has been put across by the CVC is that the time wasn't enough, that there are some charges which, which require further investigations and that they would need more time. Now, uh, the Apex Court remains silent on the prayer for more time. What it has done instead is that it has taken that report and served it upon Alok Verma. Alok Verma will now have to come back and to clarify on the questions, charges that have been leveled, uh, findings of the CVC probe. They will have to, Alok Verma's counsels will have to come clean on that. Meanwhile, Astana's counsels were also present in the court. They made a vociferous claim, also seeking a copy of that report. Their prayer was explicitly rejected by the Apex Court. The Supreme Court has only served a copy on Alok Verma. He has time till Monday to come back with the reply. On Tuesday, on November 20th, is when the hearing resumes in this case. Back to you. Well, that's all we have time on this edition of Reporter's Diary. Thanks for watching. But keep it with CNBC TV 18 is up next is Commodity Champions.